Um, we've posted officers outside and we'll be doing warrant checks at the conclusion of... <laughs> Somebody asked me as I came in if this was a sting. I assured him it wasn't. Um, I'm second generation Hungarian. My grandparents on uh, both sides of my family uh, came over, uh, went through Ellis Island. I've been able to find at least uh, one record of uh, my paternal grandfather who came in 1906 at the age of 17 with $43. And like my, uh, uh, both on my maternal and paternal side, they came over um, on what's known as steerage class. And steerage class is uh, kind of a open bay uh, area down below the, uh, the cabins. And it was not unusual to have several hundred folks down there. Cramped quarters, um, unsanitary, uh, eventually uh, as a result of uh, complaints and some litigation, and mostly uh, exposure by the media of the uh, type of uh, conditions, that uh, steerage class was eliminated. But when my, my grandmother came over, <coughs> excuse me, she would tell a story because in Hungary they didn't have bananas. And in steerage class, they just fed kind of like family style where they would throw the stuff out there and you know, the strongest prevailed. Um, and she, uh, she snatched uh, the only thing that was left, which, which was a banana. And so she's in the corner trying to figure out what to do with this. And she starts biting on it and the captain had come down and he beckoned her over and she said, nah, it's mine. And he said, <laughs> He said, no, no, let me show you. And so he showed her how to peel the banana, and that was her first experience with the, with the banana. Um, my, my family came over as a result of uh, immigration policy in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s where they needed uh, cheap labor. And so companies would pay for uh, uh, Eastern Europeans uh, generally, and specifically Hungarians, to work the zinc mines. And uh, so it was not unusual for uh, once they hit Ellis Island and, and the sponsor being the company or another family member that had been uh, uh, already had, had entered the U.S. For them to locate uh, in these uh, uh, neighborhoods where there was other Hungarians. And the zinc mine where uh, my family worked was in Franklin, New Jersey, which is uh, Sussex County, which is about an hour uh, east, or excuse me, an hour west of New York City. Um, much like uh, you know, the labor conditions uh, throughout the country, uh, labor law was significantly uh, underdeveloped. Uh, regulations as it relates to mining uh, were non-existent or very few. Um, they were in the process of uh, voting for a union, and uh, my maternal uh, grandmother's husband, <laughs> excuse me, a week before the, the union vote uh, was uh, crushed in a mining accident and was killed. Um, she had three children. Um, one of them had polio, uh, my Aunt Jane, and she was the youngest. And they had just bought a house, and of course it was a mining town, so the, the mine owned the homes, they owned the stores, uh, the medical facilities. They provided uh, uh, those uh, uh, services, of course, at a cost. And uh, I think it was within two or three months of buying the house that uh, my grandfather was killed. Within probably uh, a month of his death, uh, the mining authority showed up and said, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to pay for the house, so you're going to have to make other arrangements. And <laughs> maybe uh, this is where uh, I get kind of my frisky side is from my grandmother. Um, because she told them, she said, well, you know, this is our house. We bought it. We'll pay for it. And invited them to leave. And what she did is she uh, hired herself out as a housekeeper uh, for uh, residences. And so she would get up early, uh, send my uh, mother and uh, uh, 
her brother uh, off to school. And then the one that had polio, who was like uh, two or three, she would tote around in a wicker basket and would take her to clean houses. And she did this until uh, she remarried. And she ended up uh, remarrying a fellow that was a school teacher and was able to provide uh, uh, for her and, and the family. Um, my grandmother tells a, a lot of different and, and funny stories. Um, one of them, the village that she came from, there was a, a group of folks there that uh, different, different ethnic backgrounds, but it was not unusual in her village for them to speak several languages. Of course, they spoke Hungarian and German. Um, there was a Jewish population and. Robbie, I'm sure, will talk about that when, when he speaks uh, uh, about his relatives. And so she also learned Yiddish. And uh, when uh, she went into one of the local uh, shops, a couple of brothers owned a butcher shop. And uh, she goes in there and she asks for uh, a cut of meat. And in Yiddish, the one brother said to the other, give her the older ones in back. They're not bad. She won't know the difference. My grandmother heard this, so she didn't say anything. And they wrap it up. and. They, push it towards her, and in Yiddish she says back, if they're good enough for me, they're good enough for you, you eat them. And uh, of course they fell all over because she was a frequent customer, and uh, what could have been a tense situation uh, later uh, developed into a, a lasting friendship, much because of the bond of, of language. And I think uh, that's probably uh, uh, what uh, one of the things that impressed me when I went back uh, to Hungary. Um, in the early 80s, I think it was 82, uh, my grandmother was going to go back. She figured she had one more trip left in her and see her sister and uh, cousins and aunts and uncles, and so invited me to go with them. Well, it was still uh, you know, uh, part of the uh, Soviet uh, bloc, and so we uh, went for two weeks. It was a small village, uh, Bakunzuch is the name. It's uh, probably the largest city uh, in that area is Papa, which is probably about the size of LaGrange. It's north of Lake Balaton and uh, so, some distance from uh, Budapest. And so uh, rented a car in Germany and uh, drove down through Austria, uh, went into Hungary. And one of the things, and I was a detective at the time, one of the things that uh, I noticed uh, immediately when I uh, entered Hungary uh, was the security. I mean, it was. Uh, and the way the security was set up. Um, we had a significant inspection when we came in, but it was nothing like the inspection going out. Uh, the security system is set up to keep people in. Um, when, we, when we went out, they literally uh, took the seats of our car out to make sure we weren't smuggling somebody out with us. Um, the, the village that uh, I went to were uh, my family, very primitive. They had electricity. Some had running water, uh, still many used wells, dirt floors, um, outhouses, no indoor plumbing. <coughs> but very, very, very clean. Um, everything was uh, whitewashed with lime, uh, including the outhouse, uh, once a week. Uh, the floors uh, were uh, uh, swept and cared for that uh, the dirt had packed and it had been whitewashed so many times that it seemed like it was a cement floor, but really it, just a dirt floor over time that uh, had hardened and through the treatment of the lime had uh, uh, solidified in a way that uh, allowed for uh, you know, sweeping and cleaning and uh, just ensuring hygiene. And then, of course, uh, refrigerator, uh, very small. Uh, so uh, usually, uh, you know, if you had chicken, uh, he or she had been running around that morning, uh, that morning, and you would have uh, him or her that e that evening. Um, but very healthy food. And uh, the uh, the area that uh, uh, my family uh, lived in, the farms had had been owned. Um, by individual landowners until, of course, the, the Soviets took over. And then they became what's known as collectives. Um, of all the satellite uh, countries, and I, I don't know this for a fact, and you know, Robbie's Hungarian history is much better than mine, but of all the uh, satellite uh, countries that were part of the Soviet bloc, Hungary's, I think, their underground economy 
and their, uh, the black market and their, the way that uh, the latitude they had with their farming uh, made for a very robust uh, agricultural industry. In fact, um, I think it was in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, Hungary at that time I think was about 10 million population. France was somewhere around 55, 56 million. And Hungary outproduced uh, France in, in agricultural products. Um, so one of the, the resentments that uh, uh, I did see was how the produce and the agricultural uh, uh, products, <coughs> excuse me, were uh, confiscated uh, from these collectives uh, and taken from Hungary and then shipped either into Russia or some of the less uh, producing uh, satellite countries. Um, the experience I had in talking to uh, the villagers, the only car in the village was the one that we had rented and drove in, so uh, it was not unusual still to see uh, folks, you know, uh, pulling carts around with uh, oxen or, or horses. Um, the, the collectives, the farming, um, they were each allowed to uh, farm a, a small part or a subplot of land, and then the larger plots, of course, cultivated and, uh, and taken by uh, the Soviets. <laughs> they were, the only showers were the ones uh, in the uh, common areas where the field workers uh, worked. So in the morning, uh, there was a two-story tower, kind of a white, uh, rickety wooden tower. And whoever was in charge of uh, allocating work every morning would on a loudspeaker and you know tell the hands where they would work and what they would be doing. Um, and I would wait for that, and then when they were out in the fields, I would dash down to take my shower. Um, and uh, a buddy went with me uh, at the time. Uh, I was a detective, and he was an assistant public defender, so he's a defense attorney. And. Uh, he, uh, uh, he and I both would, would slip down there and, and take showers. And during the course of the week or two that we were there and folks got comfortable with us, uh, one of the characterizations I think uh, I would make uh, about the people of Hungary when you saw them on the street was uh, lack of eye contact. Um, when they walked, it was kind of a shuffle. And even at... <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> pollen is in the air. <clears throat> Even at 25, 26, um, what came across to me was just a sense of a lack of hope. And you could see it in their face, you know, just resigned to the fact that this is their lot and they are not going to see anything different. Uh, once you got off the street, though, and once they learned that, oh, uh, that's Cecilia's uh, grandson, and then as you walk down the street, they would be pulling you into the house uh, to talk. And my grandmother, who we had some German cousins with us, and then she spoke English and Hungarian and German, so she would be doing translations for all of us. And sometimes she would, uh, you know, she'd hit me with German, I'd have to remind her, no, I'm the English. <laughs> and, uh, and you could tell instantly, though, that uh, uh, once they figured out that you know we were the Americans and they could trust us, that uh, despite the fact that uh, they were very frustrated, and this is 82, so back in 56, very frustrated still with uh, you know Eisenhower's decision not to uh, help them during the 1956 uh, revolution. And if I heard it once, I heard it uh, a dozen times, which was, why do you pay for Radio Free Europe to blast messages of freedom and liberty to us? And then when we were able to get rid of the Russians with nothing more than Molotov cocktails and pitchforks, you turned your back on us. So we didn't uh, ask for your soldiers. All we wanted was arms. And that was, if, if I was asked that uh, once, I was asked it a dozen or two. Uh, very frustrated. Um, very uh, uh, frustrated, but still with a deep appreciation and a love for America, which was kind of paradoxical. Because on the one hand, uh, they had a lot of regard for Americans, and I think they were frustrated because they felt like they had that same opportunity for independence, and, and it missed them. Um, one of the more poignant moments 
I was walking the village with, with my grandmother and a guy in a wheelchair, older gentleman about my grandmother's age, um, which now at this time doesn't seem that old, um, um, hails us over. Uh, it's clear that they uh, you know, had some sort of uh, friendship uh, early on. And she starts translating, and this guy's now weeping. And uh, grabs my hand, and he's shaking my hand uh, about, you know, and I could make out that he's very happy to meet an American or shake hands with an American. And what uh, he uh, said through my grandmother is that he's in the wheelchair because an American shot him during World War II and is paralyzed. But he said the best treatment that he's ever received uh, was from the Americans that shot him and then hospitalized him and then cared for him. And uh, I thought that was uh, an interesting perspective uh, from somebody that uh, you know, had been sentenced to a wheelchair for 30, 35 years. And uh, no, no hint of bitterness, uh, just grateful to the Americans and understanding that you know, it's a war. And, uh, he was a casualty of, of, of that war, but nevertheless uh, appreciated uh, the way he was treated. Um, I guess if, uh, if I was to characterize uh, the uh, experience, um, several words uh, I think would describe it. Uh, one is a, a fierce, uh, appreciation uh, for the notions of liberty and independence. And I think um, that's probably why, uh, and I don't know, Robbie and I have not talked about this, so I don't know if, it's the, if he would agree. Uh, I think that's why uh, uh, Hungary lined up with Germany, uh, because uh, they did not believe in communism, and they were more afraid of Stalin uh, than they were of Hitler at the time. Um, I think that uh, uh, generosity, uh, they did not have much, uh, but there wasn't uh, an individual in that village that when they learned that we were in the area, didn't want us to come and open their home and give us what little food or, or wine they had. Um, and then the other, I, I guess, is uh, a real entrepreneurial spirit. Um, uh, they had a very effective black market, uh, and when uh, the uh, uh, when the wall fell, uh, the first country uh, that was able to respond with a vibrant economy uh, was Hungary. And I think because the black market and the underground economy then became the dominant economy. But uh, forints is the, the name of the currency, but they wanted dollars, uh, even back in the 80s. Uh, they, they wanted dollars. And if you had dollars um, and you had forints, they would prefer the dollars. Uh, I uh, be going back, uh, Robbie uh, still has relatives and contacts with the Hungarian police. And when they found out that uh, I was IACP president, second generation Hungarian, they invited me to, to come visit and speak. So I'm looking forward to that next month. Uh, it's a pity that uh, this presentation isn't after that, because I'm sure it's going to be interesting. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to share uh, a little bit of insight with you. And I look forward to uh, Robbie's presentation. Well, good morning. Uh, this is very special for me because this is not the usual university lecture that I'm giving. I'm here just as a friend of Lou, and in fact, I saw that after the overly lengthy introduction about myself, and then it will be, and this is Lou Deckmar. I think it's enough, right, in this, in this community. Um, I've worked with Lou for many, many years. I think we've known each other for about 25 years. And I've seen him emerging as a leader in the law enforcement community in various positions. Um, worked with him closely on several uh, committees, uh, including the, the, the needs of the Georgia Crime Lab. And I've developed a great deal of appreciation for him, not just because of what he has done, but because of who he is and how he has been doing it. And I think that that makes a big difference. And if it would not be sounding too pretentious on my part, I would like to say that we are sharing a few things in common. First of all, we belong to the Hungarian Mafia. 
okay? Which, uh, don't quote me in the paper saying this. Uh, if you remember the, uh, can you beat a fifth grader? And they had a question about Hungary. And this lady who clearly had no clue says, is that a country? Why are they hungry? So uh, I took it a little bit personally. Um, what Lou signifies to me, which maybe I'm getting an old hand at this, and maybe it's a different generation, Lou signifies to me persistence, consistency, dedication, public service. These are the values that I've been brought up. I was brought up when my father looked at me, it was enough. He didn't have to say anything. And God helped me, maybe even he couldn't if I would not comply with the look. It's a different generation today. So after saying all of this, um, my family story is, is similar and different. Both of our families are the product of what I would call push forces. These were forces that pushed people outside of Hungary, and there's quite a large constituency of Hungarians that live outside of Hungary. Today, Hungary is far away from the Austro-Hungarian Empire that, that uh, you know, used to be at some point. And as far as I know, Hungary doesn't have any territorial claims over those territories. So let me just give you a quick rundown and maybe some vignettes of some important uh, parts of, of, the, of the family story. Um, we lived in Transylvania, which is uh, a territory that uh, sort of shifted between Romanian and Hungarian rule. Uh, after the 1921 Trianon Agreement, there was a plebiscite uh, that uh, basically asked people if they want to be under Romanian or Hungarian rule, and they wanted to be under Romanian rule, uh, to the consternation of those who didn't want it. So I grew up in a home that spoke Hungarian, but if my parents didn't want me to understand, they spoke Romanian. Uh, not easy growing up in a house like that. Um, so uh, in 19, so when my, my parents were born, they were Hungarians. In 1940, that territory was given by uh, uh, Germany and Italy as part of the Axis forces to Hungary until 1945. The Jewish community was deported and uh, sent to concentration camps. Both my parents, who were married in 1938, ended up in Auschwitz and survived, which is not a usual story. Uh, married couples usually were separated. They found each other after the war. My mother was a refugee in Sweden for about nine months until she sort of recuperated. And then um, she uh, went and met uh, my father after the war, and they started to pick up the pieces. Uh, Act one, scene one, let me move uh, a little bit forward and then I'll go back just to make sense of, of things. Um, I remember myself as a three-year-old uh, being taken down from a ship uh, in the city of Haifa in Israel. And it was a very strange environment because everybody around me was speaking Hebrew and I couldn't understand a word. I was looking around and I looked at my parents and I learned to read and write at the age of three and four in Hungarian. I still do, by the way. Uh, not at the college level, but I still do. Uh, that's embarrassing to, to uh, lecture in Hungarian. But, but uh, fairly quickly, I, I, you know, I became an Israeli. For all that method, I had a father and I had a mother, and we didn't really talk much about the old days, so to speak. In 1962, the Eichmann trial took place in Israel, and I was in uh, elementary school, and I asked my parents the stories about it, because I, when I grew up, my mother said, eat your food, because in Auschwitz, all we had is potato peels. 
like, I'm guilty that you had potato peels and that's why I have to eat my food. A little bit child psychology here. And there was a lot of resentment about this forced guilt feelings that, yeah, of course I don't feel comfortable that you had to eat potato peels, but I don't want to finish my food. Um, so food was an issue of a fetish with people who didn't have it. And they said, you're too small to learn about these things. This is not for kids, okay? Keep in mind that in school, we went to the Holocaust Museum and we had a full-fledged lecture and site visit on this, and I'm asking my parents because despite the fact that they didn't want to say anything, they did say some things. So it's like telling a little bit, but keeping a lot back. So when I was in military service, my father decided that it's time for the talk about the birds and the bees. And uh, that's the Holocaust in my, in my language. And I said, I could care less. I, I'm not interested. Um, it is a burden that is very difficult to carry. And what happened is, is the two generations totally missed each other. And then I was 31 or 32 when I found out that actually my mother is not my biological mother. That one passed away six days after I was born, so now I'm going back to Act 1, Scene 1. And the way I found out uh, was uh, by mistake uh, from my mother. I still call her my mother, despite the fact that she's not my biological one. I didn't know anybody else. And uh, she, um, uh, she was fairly heartbroken because that was a secret that they kept. And the reason they kept it is because the social workers, the teachers, the rabbis at the time said that if you tell the child, they will not treat the parent as a biological parent, which only tells you how much social scientists know. Uh, they don't, and they still don't, and I'm a social scientist. So um, not on issues like this, but that was the, 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 the norm at the time. When I found out about it, it so turned out that very good friends of mine, uh, of the family, in a kibbutz in Israel, are actually my aunt and uncle, with three uh, uh, cousins. I'm just glad I didn't date any one of them, but <laughs> uh, it could have happened if they wouldn't have told me. And then my uh, aunt died, and I was uh, at the, I arrived two days after the funeral during the seven days mourning uh, period. And my uncle gave me a sort of a packet like this and says, these letters belong to you. And these were the letters that my mother, my biological mother wrote to her sister who was 10 years younger and she went to Palestine in uh, the mandatory period when the British ruled that place. And uh, so I collected all of this in this book, and these letters are from 1941 to 1947, three weeks before I was born. So I got to know my mother through her letters. And I found out that she is uh, sort of like Lou. Consistent, straightforward, stern when needs to be, but fun to be around. So I got more than I ever asked for because I didn't only know my mother when sort of she was alive, because I didn't, but I knew her even before I was born, which is quite, quite something. So about three years ago, I was invited to speak at a conference in uh, Cluj, the city where I was born. And because it was an academic conference, I told them the whole story, but I only defined it as letters between two sisters. And only when I revealed all of the background, and then I said, and I'm the son. And these academics had a little uh, bit of a surprise because it's not usual to have an academic conversation like this. I've started to visit uh, Budapest since uh, 1993 when the first International Conference of Criminology took place in Budapest. And I've been there probably a dozen times and then Lou and I are going back again in, in, in uh, um, uh, 
April, which is actually coming up. And uh, I, I remember a lot of things from my visits, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll share with you just a couple of stories and then I'll shut up and we'll, maybe we'll have a conversation with some questions on your, on your part. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I do want to quote maybe a couple of things that my mother said in her letters, but I was at the uh, Budapest police headquarters with the Budapest police chief. And uh, great guy, very smart, and I was looking at the pictures of the police chiefs. And I was focusing on those between 1940 and 1945. And he saw my gaze. And he looks at me and he says, we are not the Soviets, back to Lou's uh, story. We do not erase pages from the history book. We're not proud of it, but they were the chiefs at the time, so we're not going to take the pictures of the war. And that explanation was fine with me. It may have well been that one of those police chiefs was responsible for the deportation of the family. I don't know that. But on the other hand, erasing people just because they have done something bad, that's anti-intellectual and anti-ahistorical. That's just not right. Uh, I want to give you perhaps two quotes from letters that my mother wrote to her sister, uh, or maybe three, uh, brief. Uh, a few weeks after she was in Sweden, she writes that uh, she has gained weight and she's dreading when she and my father are going to meet because she's fat. Now, mind you, when women say that they're fat, that doesn't mean that they're fat. You know, it's like, that's how she felt at the time. But when she said that when she goes to the market and she sees the food, she can't help but eat it. Now, if you say today, it sounds like somebody is in a Weight Watchers class and they just are not doing very well. When you talk about somebody who did the, the, the Auschwitz trip, so to speak, that sounds very different. And then when she writes that uh, she, uh, she's going back home, and she says, home? Why would I want to go to a place where I was deported from? So two years ago, when I got my Hungarian citizenship back, to me that closed an entire historical circle, because partly I wanted to do that to regain her lost citizenship. So I have it. And last but not least, the Holocaust is a term and a concept that we know about it today. People who lived at that time didn't know what the Holocaust was in those terms. They knew what they experienced. So her younger sister, who was a, probably a little scoundrel at the time, uh, wrote to her, and I didn't see that letter, but my, sister, my, my mother responded to her, I don't want to offend you and hurt your feelings, but I absolutely resent that you wrote that I have experienced an episode. And that was it. The entire reference in 28 letters to the Holocaust was that it is not an episode. And I have never heard a better understatement about the Holocaust than that. So these are the, the letters that I sort of uh, grew up on. And the reason I, that, I bought, that I wrote this book is for my family. I wanted my son and daughter to know, and I wanted their children to know. And I am willing to bet that they have not touched the book yet. Uh, and they will, when the time is right. The book is there. That's why books are written. And uh, I also believe that there is some generic societal historical value because these letters have been written in a period that is very significant. My, my father clearly mentioned in one of these letters because he joined with a note to my mother's letters to, to the sister uh, about the um, November 29, 1947 partition resolution in the United Nations. As this was six months prior to the resolution, uh, the vote on the resolution, and he says, we hope that that will allow us to, uh, to uh, finally arrive at some peace and quiet. Uh, I call the book, The Short Life of My Mother, Not on So Calm Waters, because in almost each and every letter, she says she hopes that one day she could be in calm waters. 
that's a Hungarian metaphor, but um, I'm uh, proud to be one. I'm proud that we're going back together. I'm proud that uh, I have that heritage. It's uh, unique. Uh, uh, Hung Hungarian is not exactly an international language. Uh, not a lot of people speak it. Uh, I can still get by in, in, in Budapest with it. And uh, I've given talks about the book in Budapest, including with uh, uh, police chiefs uh, from, from the Budapest and the Hungarian National Police, and it was very well received. So I'm, uh, it's sort of, I've taken you in just a few minutes, maybe too many minutes, but in a little bit of a life story, so thanks for listening.